Okay, we're now ready to start talking about input iterators. And an input iterator is used to read values from an iterator sequence or an iterator range, typically from beginning to end, but you can also do something in the middle if you want. Uh, you can learn more about the input iterator category here at the link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, a classic example of an input iterator, the canonical one, is the input iterator that's used with the copy algorithm, which we've talked about a lot. And as you can see here, that's going to span a range. And there's all kinds of cool things you can do with this, um, one of which is truly use it for input. And that's what we're going to talk about here in a minute. So you can see how you can actually take the standard input, which is called CN, and you can create an input iterator adapter called iStream iterator. And then you can use the copy algorithm to read in the contents of the data and uh, it'll work according to this copy algorithm because it's working on an input iterator. It doesn't know it's this adapter that's encapsulating the standard input behind this cool adapter facade. So we'll, we'll take a look at that code in a second as well. There's a few things you can do, actually only a very few things you can do with a with an input iterator. You can uh, create one from using a copy constructor, you can assign to it, and you can also dereference it to read its value, and you can increment it to obtain the next iterator in a sequence. So those are the only things you can do really with, with a, uh, an input iterator. So mostly the stuff I'm showing you here, you can increment it using plus plus by one, and you can dereference it using star in order to access its value. So basically to kind of summarize what input iterators do, they can have a copy constructor and an assignment operator that work on the same iterator type, which in this case is input iterator. They can also have um, comparison operations like uh, equal, equal, and not equal for operators that are, that are going to be uh, input iterators, and then you can also have these dereference operations, the stars, and plus plus. Notice that for uh, the star operation, it can only occur on the right-hand side. So if you take a look here, you can see, um, for example, here you can see we can say star first, but you can't put star first on the left-hand side. It's only what's called an R value. We've talked about that before. And the plus plus operation can be either prefix or postfix, but I strongly recommend you always stick with prefix whenever possible because it's implemented more efficiently by the, uh, by the iterator implementation because of the semantics of postfix operations. And you'll get a chance to actually play around with that when you implement assignment number four and actually get to use iterators. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to switch over from showing my slides here and we're gonna take a look at an example and, and kind of walk through it. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take a look at some code that demonstrates how input iterators are defined and, uh, and can be used for some interesting examples. So an input iterator is the simplest type of iterator and that's because it can only be used to read forward in a sequence or in a collection of elements. It'll read the elements only once, so you can't keep rereading it unless you start over again, and it'll return the elements when it finds them. You can dereference an input iterator to obtain the value that it points to, but you can't assign to it. So another better way of saying that is that you can only use input iterators as R values, not as L values. So, uh, and that's again by design. So these are the things you can do with an input iterator. You can construct it, you can assign to it, you can check it for equality and inequality. You can dereference it either using the star operation or you can also use the arrow operator if you have an iterator to some object that has fields or methods. And then you can use post and pre-increment. And there's a whole pile of non-modifying or what are sometimes called the, um, let's call them, non-mutating algorithms. Uh, so for example, the find algorithm, find if, count, those just work on input iterators because they don't make any changes to anything. And you can basically think of these as similar to, to pointers. 
uh, and that's the way they're treated when you look at the implementation of those methods. The, a lot of these algorithms also return input iterators as the result, and so you can basically use them to kind of indicate where the item was found. So find and find if will return an input iterator, and that input iterator is either equal to the end if it didn't find the item it was looking for, or if the predicate never matched, or it returns an iterator to somewhere in the range, and then you can go ahead and do something to it, like read it or write to it or whatever, depending on what kind of iterator you have. So we're gonna look at a very simple example to start off with, which is going to have an initially empty vector, V, and then we're gonna go ahead and demonstrate the iterator mechanism here. Now, this particular use case I'm about to look at is logically equivalent to the code here. So if I wrote a loop where I made an instance of an iStream iterator, we'll talk more about that in a second, that's parameterized by int, and I give it the standard input object, then I could go through this loop for i equal the beginning, while we haven't reached the end, and I could push star i into the vector. So star i in this case is gonna reference the current int that's part of the input stream we're reading from. And I could add that to the end of the vector, and then I could go ahead and increment the count by one, or increment the, the iterator by one. So that would be sort of the, the way of doing it using a loop. But no self-respecting C++ developer would ever write code like this. Instead, they would write code using the copy algorithm, which we've looked at now many times. And what they would do is they would create an anonymous object of type iStream iterator, which we'll talk about in a second, and they would give it the standard input object, CN, by reference. And when we, when we dive down in here, you'll see how this works under the hood. The iStream iterator is actually going to store a reference to the CN object, and then it's going to keep track of that as it iterates through the range from beginning of the input to the end of file. And we'll look at how that works as well. So in this case, we create ourselves the initial input iterator, which is an adapter that converts the input stream into an iterator, an input iterator. And then we give it the end iterator. This is just a placeholder that says, I'm done. And those are gonna be the two input iterators that are passed as first and last into the copy algorithm. And then the output is going to be taking this empty vector V, this initially empty vector V, and connecting it with something called a back inserter, which is something known as an iterator adapter, which is going to take that vector and make it look to the copy algorithm as if it's going to be an output iterator. So this is really, really cool and really, really powerful. So let's go ahead and see if we can find the implementation of the copy algorithm. So here's an example of the copy algorithm that we're looking at in the code. And you can see it's gonna take an input iterator to the first element, which will be this OStream adapter, and an input iterator to the end element, which will also be an, o, an sorry, an iStream adapter, not an OStream adapter. Let me start that over again. So what you're gonna see here is how the copy algorithm works. We're going to take a, an input iterator to the first element and an input iterator to the last element, which in our case is going to be the, the iStream iterator adapter and the iStream iterator adapter for the end. And then it's gonna march through that range from beginning to end, and it'll copy each element in the input iterator and store it into the output iterator. And then we'll then go ahead and advance the input iterator and the output iterator. So that's what copy is going to do. So now that we've looked at what copy does, let's go take a look at what these things are doing under the hood, and they're really cool. Let's now go ahead and show what the iStream iterator does. And what that's going to do is it's going to create an object that can be used to read the contents. So if we go here and maybe get lucky and look for iStream iterator, you can see that this is a class, the iStream iterator is a class that keeps track of the input stream. And in this particular case, its constructor, which is this guy here that we're interested in, just goes ahead and stores the iStream, the CN, in a local value, in a local field, and it initiates a read. And keep in mind that what happens with the iStream iterator is it's got to support plus plus, so it can increment by one, and it also has to be able to support dereference. So you can see here when it does the dereference, 
what it's going to do is just return the current value that's been read. And likewise, you can see the plus plus operation here will simply go ahead and read the next element and then go ahead and return this. So that's basically how we're implementing plus plus, which increments ourselves through the input stream one read at a time and dereference, which is what's going to occur on the right hand side of the assignment, will just return the underlying value. So that's what iStream does in this case. So I'm not really focusing as much at the moment on the output stream part. We're going to look at that later, but I wanted to focus on the input stream part. And we're using CN as an input stream iterator so that we can copy and walk through it and read the values each time. Okay, so that's basically an overview of the input iterators.